Hello, 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 and welcome once again to the Body Meat Mind. Meat Mind? Meat Mind. There's meat in the mind. (laughs) The Body Meets Mind podcast. I am Paulie. Tommy, so, so happy to have you on the show again, my friend. Mate, it's good to be here. Uh, It's always good to be here. And I think, um, you know, something that you and I were speaking about before the beginning of the show is uh, how excited you and I are about the variety of guests that we get to interview. Um, Not the least the conversations that you and I have without guests, but it's certainly augmented when we get to speak to uh, people like the person we are speaking to today. Absolutely. And uh, Jackson, I, I'd like to just do a quick little uh, summary of what you are all about before we uh, say good day. Um, so Jackson's a wealth mentor. He's spent 15 years helping service businesses understand the language of money and manufacture financial freedom for themselves and their families. He successfully helped over a thousand clients build in excess of $2 billion in combined wealth and scaled multiple seven figure businesses. He's a master of helping business owners make money, work for them and turn their business profits into personal wealth. Jackson, welcome to the show, my friend. Guys, thanks for having me. Looking forward to having a, a bit of a yarn today and sharing some value. I can't wait, man. Uh, um, you know, as Tommy was saying before, we have such a vast variety of guests on this show. Uh, and, and the reason why we started this podcast is because Tom and I are both so interested in the body and the mind and how they connect with one another. But not only that, like how do they connect with other subject matters? And your authority, you're an authority on wealth creation, how to make that work for you. I believe that mindset is such an integral part when it comes to this. I just can't wait to cheer your ear off and get some really, like some amazing nuggets about what it is that you've built and how you've been able to guide so many people through this process. Let's get stuck into it, eh? Excellent. I think the first thing we should probably talk about is uh, how does one grow a beard like that, mate? For everyone listening at home, I'm looking at a beautiful uh, design of, of hair follicles on a chin here. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> mate, it's, uh, first or... It is. It really is. It is. The, there's so many similarities and metaphors between beard growing and wealth creation. <laughs> yeah. um, it's all about playing the long game, yes. uh, the marathon, <laughs> not the sprint, uh, allowing compounding to work its magic and enjoying the journey. Uh, so I think that, uh, that there's, there's a lot of lessons we can learn about uh, beard growing and money. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, uh, you go for a point. Let's start with, you know, your journey. I'd love to hear a yes. little bit about, um, you know, where you've come from and how you've gotten to, you know, creating these incredible uh, businesses that have been able to help so many other uh, solopreneurs and small businesses reach their goals for personal life. Yeah, for sure. So my journey starts from pretty humble beginnings. My parents were business owners. Mum was a hairdresser. Uh, Dad was a tradie. Had lots of different trade businesses, always working with his hands. And they were incredibly hard workers and very, very good at what they did. Uh, However, we never had much money. Um, We were always living hand to mouth. There was always just enough. We didn't really go without anything, um, but there was never any excess. And along this journey, my parents were always teaching me, like, Jackson, if you want to be successful in life, you've got to work hard for it. And I'm like, yeah, that's that all sounds well and good, but it don't, you don't really look successful to me. And they weren't. Um, and I very early on realized that they were working for money as opposed to money working for them. So I set out to really try and change the future for myself to create the catalyst for change and also help people like my parents. So I started training to become a financial advisor. And it was a stark contrast to what I thought it was going to be where I thought I would be helping people like my parents make life-changing decisions around their money. I was very much in an environment where all I cared about was either helping people who already had money make more money or sell commission-based products to people like my parents who didn't need them. Mm. And I nearly threw in the towel um, because, quite frankly, I hated what the the industry that was financial advice. And before I jumped out the door and went and did something else, I really asked myself the question, well, if I was going to do this the way that I wanted to do it, what would I call it and how would I do it? So I stopped calling myself a financial advisor and I started calling myself a wealth coach. And I created an educational framework to help people like my parents master the language of money because let's face it, most of us aren't taught and get people like my parents from their financial passenger seat into their financial driver's seat and play an active role in making money work for them. 
Um, and since then, I've been able to scale a number of multi seven figure businesses, and I've been able to create financial freedom for myself by 33. Um, and I don't tell you that to brag. I think this is the biggest issue here, guys. Much like health and mindset, there are taboos around money. People don't talk about it, and they allow money to have power over them. And this basically means that they become a victim to their circumstances as opposed to sharing their wins, their losses, their shortfalls, and focusing on rising tides, lifting all ships. Um, and this is what I'm all about. Mm. So many things come God. up <laughs> yeah. with that introduction. Let me just chime in. I'd love to just, I, I want to touch on language around money because I know mindset and language are so in, 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 they're so linked so powerfully. The language that you use with yourself, not just the way you talk about it to others, but the way you talk to yourself about money, um, most likely and more most of the time it would be subconscious as well. So the programming that people have in their mindset and that language, let's talk about language and what most people do and then what the people that have been able to create wealth have been able to succeed in doing. Yes. The big issue here, and you fit the nail on the head here, is that it's this negative self-talk around money. Like even let's think about for the most of our parents, that's how money doesn't grow on trees. Um, uh, like money is is the root cause of all evil. And there are so many people in the world with lots of money who are greedy. And even we see in, in society, like the, the the often the biggest thing that divides families is unearned money. Like somebody passes away in the family and then the people who are left fight over it and burn all of these relationships, right? Mm. And this comes from the this common thread that the vast majority of people look at money as a scarce and unavailable resource. Where when we can shift that mindset to an abundance frame, where we can start using money as a vehicle, as a tool, like a hammer or a screwdriver, like it is an inanimate in itself. It takes on the purpose and the energy that you place upon it that we can now start reframing the way that we use money as a, a tool that supercharges our path to creating the life that we want. Um, and, and this is really a big part of it. I think the second part to it, guys, is that so many people are frustrated that money is difficult and it's hard because they are trying to measure themselves by lesson number one, right? Like, let's think about it, right? Um, do you guys speak another language? I do. What's that language, mate? French. French, wow. French is a difficult language, right? <laughs> I was lucky. I, I kind of grew up with it. Um, but, uh, yeah. So if I was going to go and learn French, I'd get super frustrated, right? Like I go, oh, yeah, croissant, and then you're going to correct me straight away. And I'm like, that sounds like <laughs> exactly the same thing, right? Yes. And this is the challenge, right? Much like you can't measure your ability to speak French from your first lesson, mm -hmm. you cannot measure your ability to manage money effectively by your first introduction to it. And sure, like you, if you would have learned about money from a kid like you've done with learning French, it would be second nature. Mm. 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 So we're going to stop beating ourselves up, right? So why yeah. is there so much fear? Why, what, there's, there's, there's been a, I feel, ancestral and generational um, lineage that has kind of been passed on and there is a fear, a sincere fear associated with either the accumulation of wealth or holding onto it uh, and not letting it go. This, 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 this whole fear mentality around wealth is a really, really powerful kind of uh, stranglehold, I suppose. It is a modern societal construct, and it is very much evolved from the industrial revolution at the turn of the century, right? And let's face it, without being a conspiracy theorist here, guys, is that since the industrial evolution and the requirement of man and woman power in order to fuel the machine, the system has been built to keep you as a cog in the wheel. Mm -hmm. That's why they don't teach financial literacy at school. Mm -hmm. It is why they teach you how to conform and they measure your success of being a straight A student by your obedience. Mm -hmm. And for many of us entrepreneurs who were the, the ones that were the, the naughty kids, the ones that would always ask the, 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 the questions, we'd speak out of turn, uh, we'd be the ones that would be punished, right? Mm -hmm. um, sit in the corner with a big pointy dunce hat, right? <laughs> <laughs> and we, we become the entrepreneurs because we, we want to escape the matrix. We see things differently. I mean, it is people like us who are going to lead the way in how we change um, the status quo. So here is the problem. 
we are conditioned to think about money as a scarce resource. And we need to break that conditioning. And because all of the basic 101 wealth principles are all about shrinking your self wealth. Mm. Run a budget, spend less than what you make, live within your means, be modest, squirrel away every last red cent, play it safe, do that for 40 years, retire at 65, and then enjoy 20 if you are lucky, likely with some subsidy, uh, subsidy from the government for being a good cog in the wheel. Yeah. Mm. Fuck that. Yeah. That sounds horrible. Like uh, and the it's 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 not a a realistic way to create financial freedom for most people, right? So so all right, so that that's a really good point. So when you're when you're actually starting to work with people and work with businesses, are you starting to kind of shift the? Well, actually, let's just get right to it. What would be your definition of wealth then, as distinct from say what society's idea of it is? Yes. My motto that I use with all of our clients and I follow myself is live for today and plan for tomorrow. Now, I had a really uh, personal experience where my father, who worked 16 hour days, seven days a week for as long as I could remember, and, and followed the traditional plan of trying to squirrel away every last red cent in order to retire at 65 and live the dream. At age 66, one year after he was supposed to be in retirement, enjoying the fruits of his labor, was diagnosed with late-stage pancreatic cancer and was given months to live. Mm. And on his deathbed, he gave me one last piece of advice, and it was a quote from Confucius. And he said, Jackson, every single person in this world has two lives, and your second life starts when you realize that you only have one. Mm. Tomorrow is not promised. And the idea here of how we can create this sustainable journey for true wealth creation and financial freedom is we live for today and plan for tomorrow. Mm. Let's stop deferring gratification because it's been proven that the vast majority of people cannot do it. Mm. We're not intrinsically wired to defer gratification and sacrifice and compromise long term. So you fall off the wagon, you reinforce your failure. It further keeps you cemented within your scarcity mindset that I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I don't know enough, it's too hard because you're running a, an impossible race. Mm. Mm. So I, I'm a big believer in the idea of having your cake and eating it too. So let's get into mm. the nuts and bolts then, right? You, you say there are so many people that um, you, you say their philosophy is um, save now so we can uh, retire. How do you have your cake? And eat it too. I know that's a large bloody question, sure. but let's try and let's try and break that down. <laughs> let's simplify it this way. So, in my first book, I wrote about a a project that was done at Stanford University called the Marshmallow Experiment. Have you guys heard of it? Yeah. No. Awesome. So, for those who are listening, who maybe haven't, what they did is I tried to test whether people are born with the ability to defer gratification or whether it's a learned behavior. So, they took four and five year old kids, they put them in a room, they gave them a marshmallow, and they said, Hey, I'm going to leave. And if I come back and you haven't eaten the marshmallow, I'll give you a second one. And they left for 15 minutes. And what they worked out is that two out of three kids would eat the marshmallow some at one minute, some at four minutes, some at 14 minutes and 50 seconds. Two out of three would eat the marshmallow, and one out of three wouldn't. So that means that one third of society has some capacity to defer gratification and two thirds don't, the vast majority don't. Yeah. Then as a little bit of a, a neurodivergent person, I questioned, well, who wrote those rules? That test is all based on the assumption that there is a scarcity of means. It's either have it now or have more later. Mm -hmm. What if I want to eat the marshmallow now and have more later? I just need to increase the total number of marshmallows to three. Mm -hmm. So, Scare, shrinking yourself wealthy and scarcity-based wealth principles are built on the assumption that your income is not abundant, that it's a fixed number that you have to work within. It is not an absence of means that is the issue. It is the absence of proper planning. Mm. So if I want to live an amazing lifestyle that allows me to set up an animal sanctuary and live my dream life now and do all of these things, then I can crunch the numbers on that. And if I want to have enough surplus that I can build wealth to create freedom and flexibility in the future, then how much above and beyond that lifestyle do I need to earn in order to have both? And this now becomes my income target. But the difference being that instead of most people who just pick a number out of the air based on ego, this is a number that is intrinsically linked to the goals, dreams, and aspirations that I want. Mm. So if I can link the outcome 
to the activity required to presuppose that outcome, it completely shifts my mindset, my energy, and my determination to make that happen. Mm-hmm. And this is the core thread that of how we work with our clients. And it, it's simple, but in execution, this is what allows us to elevate our clients' results. It, it makes well, so much sense. It makes so much sense because so many of us don't actually go through that incredibly simple process. We look at our neighbours who are driving Range Rovers or Porsches and we're like, I should be driving that. We look at um, our, our neighbours who have double story houses with seven bedrooms in, you know at, at which in rationality is ridiculous uh, i mean like in the, it's fine to have but like from a practical spatial or like spatial allocation terms it, it, it doesn't make much sense so to speak but um the point is is we don't look within to be able to say what is intrinsically driving us to be able to get um, what it is that we want. So how do we how do we start that process? Because it's easy yes. to be done, right? And it's just we call it keeping up with the Joneses, right? It is the first knee jerk superficial reaction that we have because for most of us, if we we don't we're not taught how to set goals properly. Yeah. So we look at other people and we go, oh shit, that person's working towards all these things. Maybe that's what I should want. Mm. So we end up allowing other people's wants and aspirations, which might not even be what they truly want cloud our judgment and we just take those on as our own just to fill the void so we don't seem like weirdos, right? Mm. But what we actually need to do is have a methodology that allows us to go beneath the surface and get really clear of what is significant to us. And to be fair, I've made these mistakes myself. Um, I've driven the fancy sports cars and worn the expensive suits and had the, the, the gold watch and all of these things to keep up a certain appearance of status. But none of that ever made me happy. It was really a disguise to show that I wasn't truly happy within myself. Mm -hmm. And what's been interesting is that I've considered to go on this journey myself. I'm like, I'm wearing King G stubbies and Crocs right now, guys. (laughs) Hey, Crocs are good. Crocs are great. (laughs) Um, So uh, it's it's one of these things that I'm not perceived as how the typical finance guy is Mm -hmm. because I don't want to identify that way. It's not what makes me happy. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is we need to have a methodology for goal setting. And and I developed an exercise that's called the 20-year roadmap. Mm -hmm. And we take our clients through an exercise where we define all of their financial and lifestyle goals over 20 years, which sounds super scary. Um, And for most people, they're like, I don't even know what I want for dinner tonight, let alone 20 years. (laughs) But what it does is it it facilitates what we call a come-to-Jesus moment where people have a space that they can expand into. And it typically takes us months of iterations to fill this in. And to be fair, I revisit this myself every 90 days and it still evolves. But the idea of this is that if we can map this all out into what we call a three-dimensional plan, as opposed to a one-dimensional kind of one thing at a time plan, it allows us to not only get complete clarity around these things, but then reverse engineer them all backwards into the two resources we have, time and or money. Mm. 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 And it's as simple as that. So, so what, what I guess I'm like hearing from this, which again, makes total sense. And it just, it, it speaks to the, I mean, you could, you could, you could put this in the very beginning of a class at school and it would have massively changed the trajectory for so many of us. Hey, by the way, let's do this quick thing about money, but am I, am I right in saying perhaps you elaborate on this as well, Jackson, so many of us chase money as the thing in and of itself to make us happy where what we actually need to remember is that money is like a magic lamp so you can have all the wishes that you want but if you don't have anything to wish for you're not actually going to get anything out of it correct it's it's it is empty and it is fruitless and this is the big issue here and i'm a big believer in health and 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 wellness and holistic living um we grow we've got permaculture gardens we've got food Mm. forests we grow a lot of our own food it's something that's very important to us um and the big challenge here is that for most of us we are conditioned to have this one-dimensional view of success Mm. this very much capitalist view of success and look at me look what i've got look at the car i drive look at the house that i live in look at the holidays i go on Mm. which has been exacerbated by social media yeah, um, it's just crazy, right? Um, and it's created these impossible standards. And I'm a big believer of the triple bottom line. The idea here is that we we need money, but we're creating money that allows us to buy back our time. And with that time, it allows us to pursue true wealth because there are things, there are non-traditional currencies like your health, 
it doesn't matter how much money you have, you are never going to buy back. Mm. And how many people have you guys seen compromise and sacrifice their health in pursuit of money mm. and in pursuit of their ego, their, their ego based goals. And they go, they go on to regret it. Yeah. It, yeah. In yeah. fact, we, 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 in fact, we just interviewed, um, an amazing doctor who works with, uh, uh, with people who are dying, palliative care. And he, he, I mean, Tom, you can speak to this in great, a great deal more detail, but, um, you know, he talks, he, he essentially has examined thoroughly these people and their, um, their lives and what has happened and what means the most of them in their final days and in the dreams that they've experienced. And wealth accumulation or should I say <laughs> fancy cars and big houses is definitely never in any of their dreams. No, definitely not. They, I'm sure they never dreamed to have spent more time in the office, right? That's it. Um, and look, wealth is that enabler, right? It gives us the freedom and flexibility to have control over our time. And look, we're going to go to look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The idea here is that we want to get to a point of ego and ego is not a bad thing, right? It's just making sure that our ego has some substance to it because we all want to feel like we're credible and we all want to be uh, perceived as being someone who is respected and a valued member of society. And that's really what true ego is. But then it's once we've fulfilled those needs, then we can start working on self-actualization. Mm. How being in that position of abundance that we can actually make a difference uh, whether that be creating a financial legacy and building generational wealth, whether that be p- pursuing philanthropy and charity, uh, whether that be uh, unpacking your IP and having that as, a, as a, an asset that lives far beyond you. Um, this is what where, where p- purpose and, and significance is truly found. Mm. So, Jackson, who are you um, typically seeing? Obviously, you, you know, you um, uh, help many different people and businesses from all different sorts of walks in life. But if you're going to give us an idea as to who you're typically seeing um, and some of the problems and concerns they're having. Yeah. I'd say our typical clients are multi-six figure and seven figure service businesses. So they're trade businesses, they're health and wellness businesses, coaches, consultants, agencies, typically people who are making their difference in the world through high value services. Mm-hmm. And, and with that comes the fact that they've probably put all of their clients and their team and everyone else above themselves. Mm-hmm. And they've got a great business from the outside looking in. However, they have sacrificed and compromised wealth creation and taking chips off the table to build this empire. Mm. Um, and they've typically used that kind of old excuse of reinvesting back into the business, which is typically just a poor excuse for mismanagement of money. Mm. And what we help them do is take that beast that is reliant on them, implement a repeatable, simple financial operating system that takes that business from a cash eating monster into a profit making machine and allows them to supercharge their path to financial freedom, typically in 10 years or less. Um, some mm. of our clients have been able to create financial freedom in, in three or four years. Um, for example, one of my clients has just sold her business that she scaled up in five years for a, just a little bit less than $5 million, completely tax-free. And wow. she bought another business, but she's doing it as a labor of love. She loves it. And uh, she's got complete financial freedom and she can choose what she does with her time. Mm. Um, and this is really what we work with. Um, the big challenge is that just because you're good at what you do doesn't mean that you're a good money manager. Uh, or you're a good steward for your wealth. So we teach people those skills and help them implement them. And and how does it come into, say, um, someone who doesn't own a business, is an employee, but wants to perhaps generate more wealth or or perhaps recalibrate their life goals so that they can remind themselves as to why they got into that, that job in the first place? What would you say to someone like that? Tom, it's a really good question. I treat employees like they're running a business. And to, to be fair, it is a fantastic business. It is you, Proprietary Limited, where you don't have all of the extra responsibilities outside of the scope of your role. You can truly be a specialist, an expert in your area. However, what that requires you to do is to have a deep understanding of the value that you contribute to the organization that you choose to work with. Mm. So if you can help communicate, once again, that triple bottom line, that triple win, if you can work with your boss, and you can say, hey, this is my value that I contribute. I can quantify it and I then can negotiate a way to share in some of that upside. Then you have true control of your ability to appreciate your income. The big challenge that most employees have is a fixed mindset. 
They don't understand what it costs to run a business. They don't understand the true value that they contribute, how they drive profit and drive outcomes. And they're order takers. They put their hand out, Yeah. right? And they're like, please, sir, can I have some more? Mm. And, and their boss, it's not their job to understand that employee's value. It's their job to take ownership of that. Mm. So if you can understand that and take ownership, if you can set expectations of, hey, if I can help you achieve this uplift in your business in whatever area that might be, then will you share in the upside with me? Mm. And it's a win-win. And either that boss is not going to give you that, that upside, and that's fine. You now have a, a framework that you can use to go and negotiate more upside with other employees. Mm. And it, it, the, 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 the mindset, the principles are exactly the same. Yeah. And funnily enough, my life partner, Anna, she's a career coach. She helps employees exactly with this, mm. uh, following very simple, similar principles that I teach to my clients who are business owners. Um, and there are so many common threads between it all, um, and it all comes to that shift of mindset. I, I feel like this, this mindset application comes to absolutely every yeah. uh, industry. And this is what Tom and I were discussing before we got you uh, on air. It's like, if you're looking to transform your body, if your mindset is not fin- finely tuned, if you're not, if you're looking to transform your health, if your mindset's not finely tuned and acute, and you have an understanding of goals, how are you going to be able to be able to read this roadmap? Because it doesn't exist. No, you're right. We're always the biggest limiting factor in our life, in our business, right? And um, and if you're not growing, then everything else has nothing to grow into. So, so, yeah. you know, so, many, so people are going to hear this and they're like, yeah, this all makes sense. But what's stopping the vast majority of people who understand this on a rational level actually do anything with it? <laughs> There's three core problems that we've worked out. And look, I've had the benefit of speaking to tens of thousands of people around the world. And we summarize their issues into three core things. One, they don't have a plan. Um, they just either think of planning is too hard or they don't know what they want or they feel it's too complicated or they don't have the skills, but for whatever reason, they don't have a plan. So they're flying blind. Yeah. Two, they don't have the cash or they feel like they don't have the cash. Like, oh, to build wealth, I need to have surplus. I need to do this. Like, there's no point in me starting now. And for that reason, they know the kinds of things they should be doing, but they just don't feel they have the cash flow to support it. Mm. Well, let's sort out the cash flow. Yeah. And then the third part is no consistency. They're on this roller coaster ride because let's face it, we all are, right? Um, but you either become enabled by the roller coaster and work your way through it, or you become disabled by that roller coaster and you allow yourself to become a victim to it. Like, oh, I don't know where I am in my job, or I don't know where I am in my business, or I don't know where I am in my relationship or my health. Insert excuse here. Mm-hmm. And for this reason, you will remain on the roller coaster unless you do something about it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what position you're starting from, it is your duty to take responsibility to get in your financial driver's seat and guide it to the destination. And the, mm. the overarching theme across that is unworthiness. You need to in, come to terms with the fact that you are worthy and a fa- failure is going to be inevitable, but this is about progress over perfection. Uh, we are only going to grow if we're willing to fall over a couple of times and dust off our knees and get back up and keep charging forwards. That's what it's all about. Mm. It really is. And I think, you know, consistency as well is, is the major thing. Do, do you feel like people, uh, so, so I work as a counselor and uh, a, a lot of my work is in um, not necessarily um, diagnosing and stigmatizing the individual, obviously um, working off the back of personal responsibility. Cause that's like incredibly necessary for everything, but also having a look at some of the socio-cultural issues that are going on that are exacerbating these obstacles. And I feel like one of them might be, and I'd love your um, your take on this, Jackson, is that social media, whilst it's so wonderful for marketing and connection and so forth, it does really paint this picture as though where that successful person is, they've always been there. <laughs> you know, it took them overnight <laughs> and and I'll never get there or something like that. And could, yeah. could you talk to us about how how people's, probably including myself, idea of consistency, consistency might actually be way off the mark? 
it's interesting. And I, I try and talk a lot about my failures for this very reason, because I feel that so many successful people don't talk enough about their journey of what got them to where they are. And mm. they set these impossible expectations, which reinforce these invisible ceilings for, for people who are just working their way out. Right. And like, for example, in my mid twenties, when my father was first diagnosed with cancer and he couldn't work and I took over all of the household responsibilities and I had a failing business that was a cash eating monster at the time. And I nearly went bankrupt mm. and I was multi six figures in bad debt. And I was ready to hit that big red reset button and wait the seven years for my record to be wiped wipe clean to bounce back. And I refused to concede defeat. I promised that I was going to work my way out of it. And I did. And I've now gone on to build a multi seven figure in net worth and, and create financial freedom. And I have failures every single day in everything. Um, and failure is the, the, uh, is a necessity. Like I think this comes back once again to this social conditioning as children. We are measured by these impossible standards of perfection, which is not a reality. Mm. Every single person mm. who has pursued mastery in any type of area has failed thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times. It's the only way we test what works. And how I refer this to my clients is what we call money muscle memory. So let's think about this, right? Let's say you wanted to become a champion weightlifter mm -hmm. and you're going day one to the gym. And you go to the squat rack and you put 300 kilos of weight on that bar. What do you think is going to happen, guys? Pain. <laughs> Pain. You're going to hurt yourself if yeah. you didn't get the bar off the rack at all. Right? <laughs> because we've set this impossible standard. Sure, there's people out there that can that can squat uh, 300 kilos, but that's not what you should do day one. You're mm. setting yourself up for failure. So what we should do is we start with the bar. Mm. We get the form right. We build up our confidence. And then we start adding weight bit by bit. And this is the challenge. For most of us, we set this impossible standard like, hey, I need to go out and buy a million-dollar property day one, where we should be starting by setting up a low-cost index fund and putting in $50 a month. Yeah. I'll tell you guys a bit of a story here. Yeah. One of my, my most wealthy clients I ever worked with was a CEO of a $100 million SaaS business. Wow. And this guy was a, a playboy. He was flying at a pointy end of the plane and he was renting beachfront mansions and driving supercars. He was living in this crazy lavish life and pissing all of his money up the wall. And he came to me because he's like, Jackson, I've, I've got all of this, this kind of mechanism of success. My business is successful. All of my wealth is tied up in it. I don't have any wealth myself. I live month to month. And then when we first started working together, we set him up with an investment portfolio where I recommended he start investing $500 a month, which like for us equivalent is like $2, right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. And he said, Jackson, I spend more than $500 on a Saturday at brunch. Like it's not going to make a difference. And it's I a lot of smashed like, avocado. <laughs> exactly. Lots of smashed avocado. Uh, a bit of caviar on this. Yeah, that's right. And I said, mate, exactly. You're not going to miss it, right? And he goes, no, not at all. Cool. So let's start. Month one, 500. The next month was 2,000. Then it went to 10,000. Then it went to 50,000. Then it went to 100,000, which was still a, a fraction of his income. But the whole point was that it was a momentum building exercise. Mm. We were just adding weight to the bar. The hardest thing is going to the gym the first time, getting started. Mm. That's a really good point. I think um, I never um, – it's hard for me to kind of see the – I'm just like – thinking about that in my own life, you know, obviously um, there are personal reasons why we get our guests on the show, <laughs> but um, thinking about that in my own life, I never kind of saw the kind of momentum, you know, progressive overload thing um, applied, applied in the money context. So for someone who um, doesn't have that much coming in, you said, obviously you said $2, you almost kind of like saying set the bar so low to the point where it's impossible for you to fail but then don't right. do anything to touch that. So it might be $2 a month or something and just, yeah. Well, exactly. And we start. And then the, but what is important there is we have a mechanism for <clears throat> adding to the load, right? Yeah. So what I personally do, and we do this with all of our clients, is we have a recurring quarterly reminder mm. for them to increase their investment allocation. Mm. Well, there, there, and, there's, there's, sorry, continue, Jackson. Um, no, please, jump in, Paul. There's a story I, I, I recall about um, a worker in the 20s. Like I, I think it was during the, the Depression. You may be able to uh, n note the actual story where he put away a certain percentage of his income and by the time he was complete, like by, by the time his life was finished, he was like a mega, mega schoolionaire type of thing, you know, and, and, and this comes to consistency and progressive overload and all the rest of it. 
Correct. Like we go through an example with our clients and to be fair, the most of our clients as part of the roadmap that we've created will amass um, like mid seven figures in wealth over the course of time with contributing relatively modest amounts to their wealth creation. And like the, the big thing here, like we all love property. Australians have this affinity with property. And if you even just buy one investment property every five years for the rest of your working life, you will retire incredibly wealthy. Mm. And it's just like every five years, like that's boring and it should be. It's super boring. And I feel that for many of us, particularly who are entrepreneurial, we look for kicks in various places. We want to be actively involved. We're very passionate people. You know, one of my first investment mentors who managed billions of dollars of wealth said to me, Jackson, play with your partner, not your portfolio. <laughs> don't, don't look for kicks with your money. Stop Interesting. it. And it's just it, a lot of the work that we do is about reinforcing just common sense principles, set and forgetting, creating mechanisms for automation and review. And because let's face it, we're not money people. I'm certainly not a money person, which might be a bit of a surprise. I'm not motivated <laughs> by money. Yeah. And the idea here is we just want to have the peace of mind and certainty to know our money is working for us behind the scenes, which enables us to go and invest that time elsewhere in more enjoyable and fulfilling places. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that that resonates because the, so there are so many people that look at money as like a, a scratching the same itch as gambling does. Yes, and yes. you see them look at the stock market and they're like this and they're that and they're, they're, they're like you know sweating their asses off looking at um, you know things going up and down quarters of a, a, a percentage point and to me that looks like a like a, a gambling addict so to speak and it, it is. It's emoting uh, very similar traits, um, which uh, which is very interesting. But I, I'd love to ask, when we're going through a bear period like we kind of are now, uh, so to, like to, to in comparison to what we have been in the past, a lot of people look at investing, right, and they're like, right, if I were to take a snapshot of w- w- what I've invested. Uh, and I look at what I have accumulated right now, I would look at like a failure. What do you say to sure. that? It's interesting, right? And there's a there's a big part of what we do is behavioral finance because we're basically playing the game against ourselves. And there's been a lot of research that's gone into a behavioral finance principle called loss aversion bias. And it has been proven that as human beings, we feel the emotion of loss twice as significantly as the emotion of a gain. Mm-hmm. which means that when you have a portfolio that goes backwards, unless you've conditioned yourself around painting a bigger and more valuable picture of the future and what you're working towards, you are going to beat yourself up like nothing else. Mm-hmm. Like I'm an idiot. I'm a failure. I'm stupid. I shouldn't do this. I'm, I'm never going to achieve my goals. And on the flip side, because of that loss aversion bias, you are twice as likely to sit on the fence and do nothing in often the best times to acquire assets on sale than you are to go and allocate that money. So this is a simple maths here is we need to put at least twice as much effort into the future planning, the road mapping, because this is all about the journey. Mm-hmm. Like think about it this way. If you're running a marathon, you're not going to judge yourself by your split time a quarter of the way into the race. Mm-hmm. You're going to say, maybe I'm a couple of seconds behind. But cool, okay, I'm going to work on by that next milestone. I'm going to pick pick that up. So instead of just treating yourself pass or fail at every single milestone, we've got this entire race to run. So if we fall short, what have we got to do to course correct? So the idea here, though, is then the analogy I like to use with my clients is I'm like, hey, let's say you own a property, right? Let's say that property is worth a million dollars. And so after this podcast, somebody come and knocked on the door with a briefcase with $500,000 in it. And they offered you guys that if you move out today, and hand over the keys to the property, you get to keep the 500000 Would you take it? Oh, I'm on the spot here because maths and uh... – <laughs> It's, so it's it, worth a million. You know it's worth a million. They're going to give you 500000 you, you paid a million. No. But a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Is that applicable? Ooh, uh, potentially. <laughs> so it's interesting to see how this plays out. Now, the point here being is that – if you know the property is worth a million or it has been worth a million. You've paid a million. Huh? You paid a million. The 500000 you've been offered is a paper transaction unless you take the briefcase and make it real. Mm-hmm. So the market falling is just somebody coming and knocking on the door with a briefcase. Right. You only lose if you take it. Yeah. On the flip side, let's say your next door neighbor who has an equivalent property, you know it's worth a million, 
and you hear that they're prepared to sell it for five hundred thousand, and you've got the cash, yeah. would you buy it? Yes. Oh, well, if you if you if you've done what you're training all of your uh, pupils to do, and you understand that you've got the future cash flow and et cetera to support your lifestyle in the future, hundred percent you would. Perfect. Because it's not, it's at a discount, right? It's fifty percent discount. Yeah. So this is the principles that we want to teach, right? The idea mm. here is that when we're investing, we're in a market cycle. We know one out of every four years is a bear market or a correction in the market. So what does that mean happening in the, the three out of four years? Mm. Market's going out. Mm. And what, instead of trying to pick the market, we teach our clients to systematically allocate through all time periods. And sure, there's certain time periods where we can jump on opportunities and buy on discount. Mm. But we focus on trying to reinforce the positive perspective on that loss aversion bias so we don't end up becoming our own worst enemy when it comes to building wealth. Mm. But it's so interesting that in bear markets, people shit themselves immediately and sell when it should be the other way around. Or you should just hold on to it and accumulate or whatever suits your, suits your future plan. But it always seems to be the case. It's like get out, get out, get out because of this fear that it's going to drop even further or whatever it might be. I suppose that this comes to this lost bias that you're talking about. Correct. And this is the challenge, right? The markets are never the enemy. They're never the issue. The issue is always human behaviour. Right. You are your own worst enemy when it comes to wealth creation. And I think people too put too much emphasis into the tactics of investing and they don't get the, the money mindset piece right. And with all of our clients, we've been able to condition them that when the market falls, they're actually excited. Yep. And it's because we've been able to show them the, the, what's happened throughout history, get them to understand the rules of the game so then they know how to play by them properly. So, uh, yeah. Um, sorry. You go for a boy. No, oh, thank I was, you, mate. I, I, I was just frothing at the mouth of there. And I yeah. was too technical with this, but like to those who feel like the paradigm is shifting now and we're stepping into a new age, which I know has all also been, this thought process has been around for generations, you know, that, you know, we're talking about cryptocurrency now, we're talking about a new paradigm when it comes to money and wealth accumulation. Um, you talk about the cycles of uh, wealth and uh, the economy, uh, bear and, uh, you, you know, uh, getting towards a higher um, point. Do you feel that this cycle is going to be disrupted in a new paradigm or do you feel, what, what are your thoughts around this? Look, I think it's an interesting point. I think there's always going to be new things and like we're in an age of technology where innovation is happening at a rate of knots. However, throughout all periods of time, there have been three assets that have always performed. They have been the staples of wealth creation. It has been small business, it has been property, and it's been shares. And that is always going to be the cornerstone of any successful wealth creation strategy. Now, we have seen in the crypto market, and to be fair, I've speculated a little bit myself, but it is money that I can afford to lose. And as part of my own investment operating rules, I only speculate with 10% or less than my net worth because it's never going to make a difference to me. And sure, if it does well, then great, but it's money that I can afford to lose. However, I've seen people put all of their money into it. Mm. And sure, there's I've got a, a number of clients who've amassed tremendous amounts of wealth, but they've got lucky and they've acknowledged that. Yeah. And I've seen more people decimate their wealth creation because they have not understood the relationship of risk versus return, the principles of diversification, and understanding uh, what they're getting themselves into. Mm -hmm. um, and look, I think until such a time as we can identify these new age uh, investment vehicles, a true intrinsic value, like I can value a company. I can look at its financials. I can look at its strategy. I can look at its board of directors and I can formulate what the intrinsic value of that business is worth. I can look at a property and I can do exactly the same thing. Can I do that with crypto? No. Um, so for that reason, I think that these emerging technologies have a very long way to go before they become truly uh, intrinsically valuable assets. One of the things that I was listening or like hearing when you were talking about um, what the uh, the foundations of wealth creation are being, you know, small business, property, investment, you know, shares and so forth. 
I was wondering if you could speak on to the fact, it sounds to me like the common denominator with all of those three things is that we need to own something. Yes. Yeah, Robert Kiyosaki uh, summarizes this very well in his book called Cash Flow Quadrant. And he talks about there's four quadrants of wealth. There is an employee where you own a job, right? Um, and basically, you're trading time for money within a fixed environment. If you apply some of the principles uh, to that, you can have upside. And there's some great employees who've earned tremendous amounts of money uh, because they contribute value in a capitalist society. Mm. Next, you've got self employment where you own your time and you have flexibility about how you choose to use that time. But the reality is you still have a job. It's just got more flexibility and it's got more risk. Then you're a business owner. You own a system. You own a system that gives you leverage or you have a people's time that you trade for money. And then in the last quadrant, you are an investor. You own assets. The idea of all of those other three quadrants is that you take your surplus and you turn that into assets because that is the only thing that gives you true leverage. Mm, okay. So, so for someone who's like, um, so listen to this, they, let's, just, let's just paint a little avatar here. They've got a, they've got a skill, perhaps they've been working in a job that um, is quite purposeful and quite encouraging and meaningful, but they kind of want to branch out um, and start their own business that, you know, they might even be, whether they're an employee or self-employed or whatever, is the goal to get to quadrant four as fast as they can? Like, would they want to become a thought leader and perhaps write a book or, or, or build a product or how, how, what would they do? Yeah, it's personal preference. I think where I would yeah. start is I'd go through the road mapping exercise and understand what my income target needs to be to create that financial freedom. And once again, consider, can I do that in the constraints of an employee relationship yeah. just by negotiating and illustrating my value? Then because mm. we've got to realize that business is inherently risky Mm -hmm. And your revenue is not your profit. Um, I know many business owners who work far more hours for less money than what they did when they were employed, right? So it is not the silver bullet for everyone. Some people are not meant to be business owners, and that's perfectly fine. The key there is that you commit your surplus to work for you. The next step, however, if you do want more flexibility, if you can't find a working environment that allows you to have the upside of income to hit those income targets to achieve your goals, your next thing is self-employment. How do you create a freelancing style, time for money based relationship where you can charge a premium for your skill set? Yeah. You need a skill set to monetize. You just can't be any Joe Blow thinking you're going to go set up a drop shipping business and money's just going to fall from the sky. It doesn't fucking work. <laughs> Then once you've got that freelancing, sole tr that sole trader, self-employed down pat, you say, okay, can I create a system, a repeatable system that either allows me to put more people in or to create leverage through selling products, whether that be courses or whether that be programs or whatever that might be or a mixture of all of the above. Once again, that takes more risk. But all along, we've got to realize that if we're following these quadrants of business, it is normally coming at the compromise of our asset bucket. So you're always looking at that risk return trade-off. Yeah. Um, is it better for me just to accumulate assets and do it the boring way or by backing myself into self-employment, into business owner, is that going to allow me to springboard and play catch up with my compromise and sacrifice of, of accumulating assets so I can create financial freedom fast? Yeah. Or, or, or dance and play with both, right? For sure. So, yeah. So understand that you're accumulating a certain amount and then – I suppose there's this element of lever pulling where you have uh, a lever that you can pull within your own personal business where the more cash flow that comes in uh, the, the, uh, on a percentage basis, you can afford to um, then then invest into that asset, asset bucket. You so. nailed it, mate. And this is a big thing, right? What we started with is that so many business owners create that excuse of reinvesting back into their business. But and they don't need to. The idea is we want to get that business to being self-sufficient and funding itself and spitting out profits and creating cash flow and building an asset that can be saleable. So then that allows you to create financial freedom. The whole idea of having your cake and eating it too rings, rings true here as well. Mm. And so how often do you – we've got a lot of questions for you, Jason. <laughs> That's <laughs> really, right. Bring them really up. A, I just wanted to check in and just like just really thank you for how um, – down to earth and practical your responses are it's just there's, there's no would you agree with this Polly? like there's oh, no getting lost in the weeds here it's amazing it, it's straight up you've been able to find a way to articulate and communicate um 
the psychology of wealth and also the mechanics of it mm. uh, in a very, very um, accessible manner. Yeah. I yeah. appreciate that, guys. I, our listeners will really appreciate that, mate. So, yeah, thank you once again. I was wondering, um, I, I can't help but see things through the, the mind lens. Paulie probably has a bit of a, a lenience towards uh, seeing things through the body. Um, <laughs> but be that as it may, I can imagine you'd be working with people who are um, creatives, entrepreneurial in, in our world, that's called openness to experience. Um, and they're thinking about all these products and thinking about ways that they can expand and scale and grow. And then there's this kind of reconnection back to their actual reasons for connecting with you in the first place and their vision for their life and who they want to be. And do you find that there's a, there's, there's oftentimes a need to reconnect back with that so they don't get lost in making money for the sake of make, making money? For sure. It's so easy to get caught up in that rat race of it. I've been guilty of it myself. And that's why these systems are so important. Yep. And we need a system that brings us back to recalibrate, reflect. I, I personally believe reflection is one of the most powerful tools that we all have in life in general, but very much for business and for wealth creation. And we're so caught up of what's the next thing over the horizon that we very rarely take enough time to reflect on where we've come from and what's got us to where we are. Mm. And like Winston Churchill famously said, if we fail to learn from history, we're bound to repeat it. Mm. Mm. And so why are we so resistant to just spending that time to marinate in our reflection and our experience? And I think it can often be very painful, um, but it's super rewarding. Mm. And so we really want to facilitate that reflection of, hey, is this still what I want? What have I achieved? What could I have done better? What have I learned? And then using that calibration to then look out into the future, recalibrate the plan, and then get back into execution. And um, this is why these systems are so important. Mm. Makes, it all makes so much sense, man. Uh, Jackson, like, I, I personally just want to thank you so much for jumping on and being able to, as I said, communicate um, not just the mechanics but the philosophy of the way you see um, wealth accumulation and what it may, what it can mean to individuals as well and it doesn't need to mean what you see around you. It actually needs to mean what 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 is within. So thank you so much yeah. for coming on the show, man. My absolute pleasure. Beautiful. Tommy, anything to add before the, before we let this uh this wealth, oh, we, uh, we've uh, we've hit a lot, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. It's been great. Well, uh, Jackson, where can people find you and what's coming up for you on the horizon? Yep. Um, so look, I'm on most social media. Facebook is probably where I spend a lot of my time. So feel free to find me as Admin's friend. Just search for Jackson Milan. Uh, we've got some resources for you guys. So if you want to get uh, access to my best-selling books, um, calculators, toolkits, things that can help you implement some of the stuff we spoke about today, go to wealthhealthcheck.com.au. That's yeah. wealthhealthcheck.com.au. And um, this is going to give you some tools to uh, to add to your kit bag. Um, we've got programs that range from 97 bucks a month uh, and upwards. So we've tried to make it super accessible. So if you do want to get some help to take things to the next level, uh, feel free to reach out. And just remember, a good idea in theory remains exactly that, just a good idea until you put it into practice. Mm. And so uh, make sure you start implementing Jackson, thank you so much once again. We'll be sure to put all those details in the, the notes and uh, have a great rest of the day, mate. Chat to you later, guys.